So as you know, we're getting on to ionic reactions and started by talking about how important the solvent is. And we're, we started last time looking at the example of the dissociation of water into ions to give H plus and OH minus, both of course solvated. And we're interested in the important role that the solvent plays. We saw last time that we could talk about uh, water in the gas phase uh, dissociating into radicals, we know the bond dissociation energy, then transferring an electron, and most importantly then getting the two ions apart from one another, which is going to cost 320, 332 kilocalories per mole just to get them apart from being like one angstrom to, to infinitely apart. And altogether those processes cost 392 kilocalories per mole. So that would be abs absolutely uh, out of the question. In fact, even once you start in the gas phase, it's 386. So that would be 10 to the minus 290. Impossible. But the solvent makes it possible. You know that water dissociates. Okay. So when you put a, a, another water molecule, which is a dipole, next to the OH minus, it makes it more stable. We talked about that last time, that, or two times ago, how you get hydrogen bonding between a hydroxide anion and a water. So it's more than, in that case, more than just a dipole. That, remember it was that uh, double minimum that in fact the lowest energy level had the hydrogen in the middle. Anyhow, that's not fabulously strong. It's not like a covalent bond, but it's 28 kilocalories per mole, which is nothing to sneeze at. If you put another water on that, it get, you get another 18 kilocalories per mole. And if you put another and another and another and another and they line up, you get stability by 106 kilocalories per mole for solvating uh, the hydroxide ion to put it into water. So that's worth more than most covalent bonds. Okay. Now you also have the proton that can be solvated. So, and that one actually forms a bond. You can form a bond between the unshared pair on the water that's coming up and the H plus. And that bond is in fact a very strong bond. It's 164 kilocalories per mole, about twice as strong as most covalent bonds because it's not only a bond, it also gets the positive charge in close proximity to a bunch of other electrons. So it polarizes them, right? That's a little bit like solvation within the molecule. Okay, so that, so that you get 164 just for the first water onto a proton. And then, of course, that looks rather, it's charged and it's not very much bigger than the OH minus. So it's not going to surprise you that you can put more waters onto that. And, that the, and from doing the, a whole bunch of waters to put it into liquid water, you get another 100 kilocalories per mole on top of what you got forming H3O+. Plus. So if we sum all those together, 164, 106, and 100, we get, notice that those are similar to one another, we get 370 kilocalories per mole. That means we get the energy of forming the proton and the hydroxide, if they're solvated, down to within only 21 and a half kilocalories of the water in water, right? <coughs> so, that means the pKa is 15.8, you know, but it has enormously to do with solvation, as you can see here. It's, in fact, very delicately balanced. It's a small difference, this 22 kilocalories per mole, of very large numbers, things that total 392 kilocalories per mole. So if any of these steps had been off by a few percent, right, the dissociation of water would be very different, right? So this is a, a sign that you have to be careful because whenever you're dealing with, with small differences that come from very large influence, very large effects in the first place, it could go any place. And in the case of water, it happens to be that water will dissociate with a, with a dissociation constant of 16. But uh, it, it, it has to be regarded mostly as an accident because of this important role of solvation. Okay, now we're going to generalize into Bronsted acidity, other things giving up protons. Or you could call it substitution at hydrogen. Here's HF, and we talked about this last semester ad infinitum, how we could make and break a bond at the same time. 
by bringing up, say, water, right, and get H3O plus and F minus, that is, HF acting as an acid, hydrofluoric acid. So that's Bronsted acidity, giving up a pro pro proton, but it could be thought of as substitution at hydrogen. Something new comes in, the old thing leaves, fluoride in this case. Uh, now, this happens, of course, in a solvent. Just as in, just as in the case of water, HF isn't going to dissociate to H plus and F minus in the gas phase. It's the stabilization of those ions by water that make this accessible. So, is it going to be like water where you have these enormous things and there's no predicting what will happen as to how strong the acid will be? To a certain extent, that's true. But, fortunately, the solvation energies of analogous compounds are similar enough that we can often make reasonably accurate predictions, or at least, if not predict, at least once we've seen the results, we can rationalize them reasonably, of the relative acidities in terms of molecular structures. That is, if we can cancel out, because they're very similar, all these solvation things, then we can look at the molecules themselves and try to understand why one is more uh, acidic than another. And that's what we'd like to be able to do because it's much simpler to think about just the molecule than to think about how the sol all the solvents would be arranged around any particular molecule or ion. So let's try that. Now, uh, as background for talking about acid, you've, in your AP chemistry, looked at pH and pKa. And there's the question, why should organic chemists bother about pH and pKa, which you've already done in your, uh, in your AP. It seems like a topic for general chemistry, not organic chemistry. But there are several reasons why it's important in organic chemistry, and I'm sure that all those various textbooks you have have a, a chapter, a section about, about uh, Bronsted acidity. Because in the first place, whether a molecule is ionized or not is important for predicting reactivity. That is, the availability of homos and lumos, how high, how low they'll be, depends on whether it's an ion. Also, the things like conformation, the color, the proximity to other species, mobility, particularly if you're in an electric field, uh, is, is a big function of whether there's a charge. So you want to know whether molecules are ionized or not. And one of the simplest ways of making ions is dissociated to proton. And because the ease with which a species reacts with a proton might predict how readily it reacts with other LUMOs. So often we're not specifically interested in how, how, much, how easily a proton would react with some high HOMO, but we are interested in how someone else would react. And if we're comparing two high HOMOs to see which one's more reactive, it wouldn't be surprising if the one that's more reactive with a proton is also more reactive with the molecule we're interested in. So if we can easily measure reactivity with a proton, the reverse of which is acidity, if we can e easily measure that equilibrium, then we have a scale to talk about how low LUMOs are, how reactive LUMOs might be. So that's why acidity is particularly important in organic chemistry because it could predict organic reactions, that is, reaction with the LUMO sigma star CX or pi star CO might parallel the reactivity with a proton. Okay? Now we know that the acid dissociation constant is the product of H plus and B minus over HB where B is some base or HB is an acid. <coughs> and if we take the logs of both sides, we see and rearrange a little bit, we see that the pH is the pKa minus the log of the ratio, how much of the stuff is ionized and how much of the stuff is in the acidic form. And if that ratio is one, if, if it's half ionized, then the log of one is zero, so we forget that, and then pH is equal to pKa. So when you have an acid with a certain pKa, if the pH is that value, then you have 50-50 ionized and unionized form. Okay? Now, you, you often use things like that as indicators. It might be that the, that the ionic form is colored or has a different color from the, from the protonated form. Then if you see that color or not and can measure its intensity, you can tell how much is ionized. So you can measure that ratio, right? But you can't measure it over really wide range because 
you suppose you could measure when there's only when there's five percent of the colored species or up to 95 percent but beyond that the colors aren't distinguishable that would be fairly reasonable so if you go from 95.5 to 595 that covers just this ratio that covers just two and a half pH units so if you want to use an indicator to measure the pH of something you can only measure it with that indicator over a very narrow range by measuring the ratio of how much colored to uncolored stuff there is. Okay? Beyond that, you have to get some other indicator, and then some other indicator, and some other indicator. So you can have a ladder of indicators that allows you to cover a wide uh, range of pH. And then you can bootstrap that way with overlapping <laughs> indicators to get a wide coverage. Okay, so with a known pKa, you measure the pH by measuring the ratio of the ions ionized to the unionized form. Now, let's look at factors that influence the acidity because they may also be the ones that influence reactivity in other organic reactions. Now, pKa normally is defined in water, right? The, the, uh, we, we just saw that the dissociation constant for water in water, that is losing the red proton there, is 15.7. Now, if you tried to, to get a pH higher than that, what would happen? If you, went, if, you, if you had water and you made its pH 20, let's say, or 18 instead of, in, instead of someplace in this range, what would happen? You'd have a strong base in there, that base would pull protons off the water and you wouldn't have any water anymore. So it wouldn't be anything like the same solvent if you tried to get a higher pH than that. So you can, so, and the same thing is true if you look at the dissociation constant of H3O plus. At, at, uh, at a pH of minus 1.7, it would be 50% protonated. But if, if water is 50% protonated, it's not water anymore. Right? So if you're within this range between, say, 0 and 15 or something like that, then you have water and you can talk about things. But if you try to get out of that, you can't use water anymore because all you're doing is making all the water into ions. Right? But in that range, you can work. So in that range, there are a number of interesting things, like ammonia can be protonated. It, the ammonium ion has a pKa of 9.2, so at pH 9.2, half of ammonia is protonated, the ammonium ion, half of it is NH3, right? Does it surprise you that, now let's, let's get this straight. So NH, uh, NH4, acting as an acid, NH4 plus is 9.2, uh, H3O plus is minus 1.7. Which one gives up its proton more easily? H3O plus or NH4 plus? Which is the stronger acid? Okay. Which one would take the proton from the other one? Debbie, do you have an idea? Right, so it will it would protonate uh, NH3. So if you had H if you had H3O plus and NH3, it would be downhill in energy to transfer the proton to the NH3. Why? Why is it better to put the proton onto NH3 than onto H2O? What is it about NH3? It makes that a stronger bond. So you have a proton plus something that has an unshared pair. They come together to form a bond. How much energy are you going to get out of that bond? What, what is it? The proton is the same in all cases. What difference is there in the unshared pair between nitrogen and oxygen? That means that nitrogen will hold the proton more strongly. Sebastian? It's a higher homo because nitrogen has a lower. Right. Lower nuclear charge, higher homo, stronger bond, better energy match. Okay? So we understand that difference here of, of uh, what is it, uh, about 11, kilocal 11 uh, pH units. Okay? Okay. Here's FH. 
right? 3.2 hydrofluoric acid, not nearly as good an acid as H3O plus, right? But it's a lot better acid than, than HOH, than water, right? By uh, 12, 12 and a half powers of 10, right? The reason is the same, fluorine, uh, uh, that, that oxygen, uh, has a higher HOMO and holds the proton more strongly. So we can understand that. Uh, H2S is 7.0. So now, that seems a little funny compared with, with, with water. Uh, but notice the bond dissociation energies, right? Well, actually, it's, it's, a, it's reasonable it, it, sulfur is not as electronegative as oxygen, right? It's, it's, uh, homo is, is, it, it's homo is lower. Pardon me, let me get this straight. <laughs> you always have to think these things through. I realize I'm rattling it off quite fast and it'll take a little while looking this over in your own room to get it straight in your head. But it's interesting that if you look at the bond dissociation energies, Sulfur is between oxygen and fluorine, right? So it's more than just how strong the bond is, right, that determines sulfur to be in the middle, right? So we're gonna talk a little bit about that. So here are hydrogen attached to various elements, and we're going to look at the pKa's. Now, if we go across the top row, you see that, that the ease of heterolysis, how strong an acid it is, increases to the right. So it gets easier to break the bond into ions as you go to the right. But if you look at the bond strength, the bonds get stronger as you go to the right. So the ease of homolysis goes the other way, right? But this is exactly what we talked about a time or two ago when we looked at the, at the energies of two things and said that homolysis and heterolysis are, obvious, are, are opposite one another whether you take the two electrons, whether you put them both here in heterolysis, or whether you put one here and one up there in homolysis. So that's the same thing we talked about before. So the energy mismatch, the electronegativity difference, makes it easier to, uh, uh, makes it uh, uh, easier to do heterolysis, but harder to do homolysis. But notice it's not the same when you go down the periodic table. Right? Now the red and the black arrows are in the opposite direction. Fluoride is the most electronegative, right? But it's the weakest acid among the hydrogen halides, right? And in that case, it is the bond strength that's making the difference. And that's what made the, the sulfur here different from, uh, uh, made the sulfur uh, more acidic than oxygen is because of the weaker bond strength, okay? So that has to do with decrease of overlap. Going across had to do with the energy match. Okay, so we understand those things. Now we can learn by knowing pKa values some of the things that influence the energies of these bonds. Okay, so here's an OH bond in acetic acid. Of course, it's called acetic acid. Water is not called aqueic acid or something like that. Right? So this is much more acidic, 4.8 versus 15.7. So it's 11 powers of 10 stronger as an acid. Why? Is it because the bond is intrinsically stronger? They're both OH sigma bonds. The bonds are essentially the same. But the anions are different. And we've talked about this before. The special thing about the anion, what, what is it that makes the anion that you're gonna make here unusually stable compared to HO? Resonance. Right, there's gonna be resonance that'll make it stable. Okay, or homo-lumo mixing, if we wanted not to use the language of resonance. Okay, so the, the low lumo of pi star stabilizes the electrons we're putting on oxygen. Okay, now, if you make chloroacetic acid, then it's another two powers of 10 stronger. Why would that be sensible? Anybody got an idea about that, Ellen? Right, it's an inductive effect. The, elect the chlorine is electronegative. It withdraws electrons from this carbon, which withdraws electrons from that carbon, which withdraws electrons from that oxygen, and makes that a better place to put a negative charge. 
right? So it's worth a factor of 100. So we have some measure here. Because these equilibrium constants are e easy to measure for, for, acid diso e for reversible acid dissociation, it gives us a scale that's easily accessible of how important something like an inductive effect can be. Or if we look at this one where we're breaking a CH bond, now carbon, of course, is not, is not a norm, normal carbon-hydrogen bonds aren't acidic, but this one is rather acidic. It's as acidic as the ammonium ion, right? Why? Because there are two uh, pi star vacant orbitals next door that can stabilize the high homo when you make carbon minus by losing that one. So again, we have a quantitative measure of how important this might be. Now here's an amino acid, alanine, in the, in the form that's protonated here on nitrogen. And it's pKa, it's even a little bit stronger acid than the chloroacetic acid. Why would you say so? Nitrogen is not more electronegative than chlorine, not withdrawing more electrons than chlorine is. Or is it? Lauren? It's got the positive charge. Ah, the positive charge. That makes it very electronegative. Okay, let's look at that one in a little more detail. So how, and it also shows how you determine these pKa's. So you can titrate alanine. You start with this protonated form uh, that in acidic medium at pK, pH zero, say, and it's got that red proton that can be lost. And then we're going to start running in hydroxide, right, until we've put in two equivalents of hydroxide. In the, in the first, uh, when we add the first equivalent, we'll take, we'll, we'll uh, take off that red proton, right? And then we'll be, take the one off the nitrogen when we add a second equivalent. But let's look at how the pH changes as we pull off those, as we add the base and pull off protons, okay? So it looks like this. It changes very slowly in there and is said to be buffered and then it changes rapidly again. Now why is that? Why, why doesn't it just a straight line as you add more and more hydroxide and watch the pH change? Be uh, okay, so here we have it. it. If you want to change the ratio by nine-fold, you could change it from three to one to one to three, okay? So that's a nine-fold change in the ratio. And remember the ratio is measuring the change in pH Right? So if you change the ratio by 9, say approximately 10, the log of 10 is 1, so it would change the pH of the solution by 1. So adding, adding half an equivalent of base, from going from here to here, changes it by about 1 pKa unit, right? 2 to 3. Right? Now suppose we want to change it, the pH from 3 to 4. How much do we have to add? If we change the ratio by a factor of nine, again, I use nine just because it's convenient, three, you know, three to one to one to three, right? If we want to change it by a factor of nine again and go up by another pKa unit, pH unit, logarithmic unit, then we only have to go from one to three to three to 100, right? That's another factor of nine change, right? But it only takes 0.22 equivalents to do that. Right? And then, if we want to change it by another log unit, it takes only 0.03 equivalents. So during this region, when the, when the ratio is someplace close to 50-50, it takes a lot of conversion in order to change the ratio very much. But when you're out, the, out at the end and you only have 1% or a couple percent of something, then it doesn't take much change to change the ratio enormously. Right? So that's why you get this behavior as a buffer where if you put a lot of that stuff in and you have roughly 50-50 of the ionized and unionized form, you can do a lot of adding acid or base and it doesn't change the pH significantly. But if you're out in this region where you only have a few percent of one or the other, then it changes drastically. And now if we keep going, we take off this proton. And again, it's slow and buffered and then it goes up again, right? Now, how can you find the pKa of the compound? having done one of these titrations where you run in and measure the pH as you're going along. Right? Remember, the pKa is the same as the pH when what? 
when the ratio is 50-50. Okay? So that means if we take it where the ratio is 50-50, that's the first pKa, the pKa for this proton, right, the red one here. So the pK1 is 2.35, right? Now, it's reasonable that the proximity of the positive charge to the carboxyl group that's going to be losing a proton, having the plus charge here, what uh, Lauren was telling us about, is, is, is going to make it, here it is, 300 times easier to remove the H plus from the, this cation rather than acetic acid, which was 4.5 in its pKa. So we went from 4.5 to about 2.5. Well, a little bit more than 2.5. We went 300 times better because of that positive charge, making it easier, stabilizing the anion we're going to get here, right? Having these two charges near one another. So that's reasonable, all right? And now we take off the second proton, and we find that that's pKa 9.87. Now, how would you expect that to compare with taking a proton away from a normal amine? Where you don't, this, here we're taking the, the proton away from an ammonium ion to generate an amine, but now we have a negative charge that's making this more stable. It'd be harder to pull away, right? So at first glance, you'd say it'd be at about the same. If this was a factor of 300, if this was easier by a factor of 300, because this is so stable, then this one, taking that second proton off, should be harder than 300 compared to a normal amine, because this thing is so stable, okay? So, <clears throat> with a proximity to the negative charge should make it about 300 times harder to remove proton from this so-called spitter ion, the thing that has both positive and negative charge, than from a normal amine, like, like say, ethylamine. Now, ethylamine is pKa 10.6. It's actually five times easier to take the proton away from alanine, from the spitter ion of alanine. It's easier to take it away, the same way this one was easier, as compared to a normal ammonium ion. That seems absolutely backwards. It should be 300 times easier. Now, why? Why is, it, why is it easier rather than harder to take it away from here rather than here? Okay. So you'll notice that this, it's a question of compared to what, right? Is this a good model for this when it has a proton on it that isn't charged? Not really because this has this carbon with a bunch of oxygens in it. And, th and this one, the ethylamine, doesn't. So maybe the electron withdrawing effect of those oxygens, right, is, 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 uh, is making it easier to give up a proton here, is stabilizing the anion the same way chlorine did. Remember, in chloroacetic acid, it was withdrawing electrons and making it easier. So maybe we should compare uh, compare this not with ethylamine, but with something that has the oxygens but doesn't have the charge. Okay. So we can do that by making it an ester instead of an acid, right? So it doesn't have the charge on it. Its pKa is 7.3, right? So now, in fact, it is harder to, to take away, and it's about 400 times, about what we expected, right? If we have the right comparison. Okay, so having these charges change the, it changes the uh, pKa in a reasonable way. Okay, so apparently the CO2 group lacking charge is sufficiently electron withdrawing to destabilize that cation more than the negative charge stabilizes it. Okay, now uh, notice here we've changed the scale. Now we're going from 10 to 50. We're going to, to very, very weak acids. Okay, and of course we can't do that in water because water has a has a, a, a pKa of of 16, and if we try to get to get more basic than that, we just convert water into into hydroxide. It's not water anymore, right? So we're going to have to use other solvents to do that. But it, if we use these other solvents and again use indicators, bootstraps to go to go on up, right? Then we get that, 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 N, uh, that, the nit that a hydrogen attached to nitrogen. Now we're not talking about an ammonium ion. 
right? That's what we were just talking about, taking a proton away from NH, from R NH3 plus. It's not that anymore. It's taking the hydrogen right away from nitrogen without the charge, right? So it's much harder to take it away than it is to take it away from, from uh, water, which is what you expect, uh, uh, because uh, the energy match was better here. Okay? And if we go to carbon, then it's just, it's way, way up there. 52. Now, you'll see different, in your various books, you'll have different values of that. It might vary by as much as three or even four pKa units because you have to go from one solvent to another here and use these indicators to, to know what the equivalent of pH would be, right? And that's, it depends on which ones you use to do that. But anyhow, it's, it's way up there, okay? So these values are approximate because the, the, the equilibrium for bases stronger than hydroxide can't be measured in water. You have to bootstrap by comparing these acid-base pairs and other solvents. Okay, so that one's a bad E-match for OH, a better E-match for NH, and a great E-match for CH, so it's holding the bonds stronger together and making it harder to form the anions. Okay, now here's another CH bond, but it's significantly more acidic. The hydrogen attached to a double bonded carbon. Anybody got any ideas why that uh, would be easier to break? Does anybody, can anybody think of an idea why it might be harder to break a proton away, to break a bond to hydrogen when it's attached to a double bonded carbon? Ellen? Uh, ah, it's sp2 hybridized, so the bond's going to be stronger that you're going to be breaking. But in fact, it's easier to ionize it. So there must be, if it, it's not because of the bond strength, that would go the other direction. It must be the ion that's unusually stable. Can anybody think about why the ion might be stable for, in this double bonded carbon, the unshared pair? Honorai? Uh, the pi star of the ion will stabilize the ah, charge. You could get resonance, right? The pi star stabilizes it, but thanks for biting on that, because it doesn't work. You see why? The, so here's, here's, here's the, the two hydrogens on the carbon, double bond here, okay, on that carbon. Why is it that when you pull this proton off and generate a pair of electrons here, why isn't it stabilized by the pi star? They're orthogonal. So you're not going to get it that way. But this orbital is sp squared not sp cubed as it is in the other one, the one that's 52. So it's a lower energy orbital for the electrons to be in. So it's a more stable anion. Okay, that's good. Now, um, here's an acetylene, right, that loses its proton, and it's 20 powers of 10 better at losing the proton. Why? All right, let's come back to you on that one. The uh, resonance on the ion? No, no, it, it's still not resonance because, but here's, here's the carbon. Here's the hydrogen coming out at you. There's a pi orbital that's this way and a pi orbital that's this way in the acetylene, but both of them are orthogonal to that, right? What's good about it? It's sp hybridized, it's SP hybridized right? So here we go from, from uh, sp cubed to sp squared to sp, and it gets more and more. Uh, uh, so sp cubed anion, uh, sp anion, no pi overlap, and an sp squared anion, no pi overlap. And Anurag, I'm going to do you one more because you're being so good to me here. So we're going to take it away from this, hy this hydrogen, right, which is not on the triple bond. This one was, the hydrogen was on the triple bond. Now we're taking it away from a carbon next to the triple bond. Or here we're taking it away from a carbon that's on a double bond, but it's also next to a double bond, right? Why is it, it wasn't, now why do you say it's good? Resonance. Resonance, <laughs> now you got it, right? Because now when it's, not, when it's not one that's on this, either a double bond or a triple bond, but it's on the carbon next to it, now it can point this way and be like that and overlap and get the resonance stabilization, so you were right. Okay, so this is the homo pi star overlap, finally. Okay, and there we see it. Okay, now, uh, there are 
fabulous tables of people who have measured these things. So for example, uh, this, this is a, a website from a course at Harvard Chem 206, which has uh, six pages. This is the first of six pages. So all different uh, uh, PKAs of many, many different compounds losing their protons. Uh, there's a, another compilation at another website here, which I think is even bigger. Okay, so you can, this is interesting uh, tables to look at to see if you can figure out, look at molecules that are very similar to one another, so solvation will be more or less the same, and you don't have to worry about that, and see what it is about the change from one molecule to the next. How can you explain in terms like we've been talking about, hybridization, resonance, electronegativity, that is uh, the homos and lumos, how can you explain these trends seen over uh, similar uh, compounds? Uh, so here's a problem for Wednesday, okay? Uh, list the factors that help determine the pKa for an acid, right? Then choose a set of several related acids from one of these pKa tables, or your text will have some too, I'm sure, and explain what they teach about the relative importance of these factors, right? Which is more important, resonance or hybridization, as we were talking about here? And so just practice yourself by choosing a set of three or four or whatever number is, is, seems to be there of related compounds where you see structural changes and see if you can rationalize why they have the pKa's they have. And then, once you've done that in the privacy of your own room, explain your conclusions to at least one other class member and decide together how unambiguous your lesson is. Did you think it through, or was there something you forgot, or did you get something backwards? Okay, so that's your assignment for Wednesday, and feel free to consult a textbook, uh, the problems in textbook, they'll have problems about PKs, uh, and the references at the end of the tables if you want to. And there's a hint that, you know, this, that would make a good exam question to, to, for you to explain something like that. Okay, now nucleophilic substitution and beta elimination. So we've, we've been talking about this Bronsted acidity in order to understand reactivity in more typical organic reactions. So let's see if we can use these ideas in understanding nucleophilic substitution and beta elimination. And in the, the uh, Jones textbook, uh, that's chapter seven, but there'll be corresponding chapters in all the books that you have. Uh, and you can al we also started talking about this in lecture 16, as you'll remember, where we talked for, about acid-base reactions and about SN2 substitution and that they really were the same reaction in terms of the orbitals that were involved. Okay, and in fact, the beta elimination, or E2 elimination, remember we talked about at the same time in lecture 16, where the, where the base takes off this proton, you generate the double bond and lose the leaving group there. Okay, now, th they were, these reactions weren't discovered by people who understood mechanisms and and, uh, and applied them to many different, uh, uh, to, to see what they could make in the laboratory. They were discovered by people fiddling around with things and seeing what would happen, right? And it's only 100 years or 150 years later that people began to really understand what was going on. So for example, Alexander William Williamson in Britain in 1852 discovered that treating this alkoxide with ethyl bromide could do a double displacement reaction, right, where you exchange partners and the ethyl goes on the oxygen and the sodium goes with the bromide, right? Uh, Finkelstein, uh, who was a, a, a chemist in the Netherlands in 1910, found that sodium iodide reacting with RCl could give uh, Ri, so you could exchange iodine in place of chlorine and get sodium chloride. Now all these things have their own little bit of lore about them. The reason that reaction works so well is that sodium iodide is soluble in acetone, the solvents that's used. But sodium chloride is not soluble in acetone, right? So when you mix the two, you can imagine either of them replacing the other one. But the equilibrium is driven toward the products by the fact that sodium chloride precipitates. So all of these reactions have their own twists about them that make them uh, uh, interesting and, and uh, variable. But there's generality too. For example, he could also do this trick with 
an alkyl bromide instead of alkyl iodide. So, so if you can only do something in one particular case, no one cares very much about it. But if it's general, then people can apply it to their own problems and it becomes much more interesting. Okay, so generalization is the name of the game here. And both of those reactions, the Williamson ether synthesis and the two flavors of the Finkelstein reaction, both of them involve exchanging ions. You start with one pair of ions and you end with a different pair of ions. It's one of these double decomposition reactions. Then in Russia, uh, Menshutkin in 1890, discovered that you could react a triethylamine with an alkyl iodide and generate the salt, a tetravalent ammonium salt as an iodide. Notice that this seems to be different from the first one because the first one just exchanged ions. This one actually creates ions where there weren't ions in the first place. Or Hans Mervine, working right after the Second World War in Germany, uh, discovered that you could use this thing called Mervine's reagent, which is a special kind of oxygen oxygen plus because it has three things attached to it, trimethyl oxonium, uh, fluoroborate is the anion that he used. And this could react with RO minus to give RO methyl. That is, it's a methylating agent. It puts methyl onto oxygen, right? But notice in this one, you actually destroy ions. You start with four ions and you end with two ions. So at the top, we have an exchange of ions. Then we have creating ions. Now we have destroying ions. But the thing that's, and then there's solvolysis, where you have, where the reagent actually is the solvent. Ethyl re, uh, can react with, uh, with the carbon displacing bromide as HBr. Okay? So that solvolysis means breaking apart, that's the lysis, by the solvent. So all these seem to be, you know, if you, if you had a list of reactions you'd have to memorize, they'd have all these different reactions, the Williamson ether synthesis, the Finkelstein reaction, the Menschutkin reaction, the Mervine reaction, solvolysis reactions, and so on. But the great thing is that they're all the same. Once you understand the mechanism, they're all nucleophilic substitution, right, which is the subject of this, uh, this part of the course, because all of them have some unusually high HOMO, which reacts with an unusually low LUMO, which is a sigma star orbital. So it breaks the sigma star as the new bond is formed with the HOMO. So if we're talking about the generality of nucleophilic substitution, we should generalize over variety in all the different components of the reaction. So you have, uh, 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 just to give you an example of how, how many different kinds of nucleophilic substitutions, uh, there are. Uh, consider adenine, which has lots of different unshared pairs on the nitrogen, right? And ribose, a sugar. Okay. Now, here you have a HOMO on the nitrogen and a sigma star LUMO of the carbon oxygen. And you can substitute the nitrogen for the oxygen. Actually, as we'll see shortly, it's not quite the same where, the, where you push the OH out. But anyhow, that's a substitution at carbon, which loses water then and makes that NH bond. And that stuff is called adenosine. So the OS part of the adenine plus the OS comes from ribose. So that's adenosine. Now, so we have adenosine. And here's methionine, an amino acid. And it has a, a HOMO, which is an unshared pair on the sulfur there. And it has an OH that could be a leaving group. Right? So you can substitute SR2 for OH at carbon right? and do another nucleophilic substitution. And you get this thing that's called S-adenosyl methionine. It's methionine that has this uh, adenosyl on it. Okay? And that is this stuff, stuff you may have heard of, SAME, S-adenosyl methionine. You can buy it in uh, vitamin stores, but it's very popular with nature as well. So if you have an amino acid or something that has a nitrogen with an unshared pair like the nitrogen in arginine, <coughs> then you can do a nucleophilic substitution reaction. 
where uh, it, you substitute NHR2 for SR2. So it attacks that carbon, the leaving group leaves. So here's the third nucleophilic substitution reaction, and it ends up with a methylated amino acid. Or that arginine could have been part of a protein, and you'd have a methylated protein. So uh, then you can have another one where a base comes along and takes the proton away. But that's nothing but a substitution at hydrogen, right? To, and leave the electron pair on nitrogen. Okay? So, and this is biological methylation, which I know practically nothing about, except for the fact that, uh, that our daughter, who was a student in this course 20 years ago, is now a professor of biology at Bowdoin College, and she works on biologic, biological methylation, on uh, protein modification by methyl transferases. And I talked to her on the phone night before last to check this out. She says, yes, indeed, this is the compound that's used in practically all uh, biological methylation reactions of proteins. So uh, these nucleophilic substitutions have broad generality and are very important. And what we're going to be studying then is how the different components influence the rate of these reactions. So we have the nucleophile, that'll, the high homo that's coming in, well, we could vary that. Uh, we have the substrate, what various R groups we could have. In, Included in the substrate is, of course, whatever is going to be leaving, the leaving group. We could vary that and see how it affects the reaction. Uh, it takes place in some solvent. That's going to make a difference. And, of course, there's some product being formed. So all these things can vary. And now, although we looked uh, schematically at the uh, early on, last, in the middle of the semester, last semester, we looked at this idea of the HOMO attacking the sigma star and a leaving group leave. Now we're going to look at the details of how, as you vary these things, the reaction becomes more or less easy or takes some completely different course. So that's going to be the project we begin next lecture.